Next up on stage, ladies and gentlemen. Next up on stage. So, you need to tell me if this is the one you've all been waiting for. How many people have been to Unalaum in Glasgow? Oh, hey. No wonder your cash registers are ringing, Mr. Cheevers. So, from, we're very, very pleased to have back on stage our fishmonger to the stars from CPM Stewart. And if you could put your hands together for the one Michelin star, Graham Cheevers, from restaurant Unalome. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome him on stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to come and see us today, <coughs> and for George for the invite. So I'm going to do two dishes along the style of the restaurant food, and something hopefully that you can all go away and replicate at home or at college or in your own workplace. So I'm going to quickly run through some ingredients I'm going to use and some techniques. So the first dish is a stuffed loin of cod. So we take the cod and we make a mousse and roll the, the mousse around the top loin of the cod and serve it with a nice simple dash of butter sauce. So for the sauce, I use two ingredients to start with. Some uh, kombu, which is a type of seaweed from Japan, from an island called Hokkido in the north. It's very um, flavoursome, gives a good dashy stock base, if everyone knows what that is. It's a Japanese type clarified liquid that tastes of the sea, or as everyone calls it, umami. So from that, we basically use this, and we put 10% of this into water and bring it to 60 degrees. And after that, we leave it to infuse for an hour. Any hotter, the stock becomes very bitter. We remove that from the, the, the liquid, and we're left with a clear style broth like this, which I brought some along, because we don't have an hour to waste doing this, this this afternoon. And from there, we add some katsubushi. If everyone's used this before or knows what it is, it's basically dried tuna flakes. A lot of the guys in work call it fish food, because it tastes a little bit similar. So it's smoked and dried tuna, which they shave very finely. So that then gives us our stock base. So we'll start talking about the fish next with our fishmonger here. Um, we've got some cod, which has been left over. So we're going to fill out the cod first and maybe explain where it comes from, sure. how it's caught, and the quality signs of the fish. Okay, yep, sure. So the cod here, as Graham said, it's like half, half was used earlier on. Um, all the, the round fish that we get at uh, Camels is from the three main markets, uh, Shetland, Peterhead, and uh, Scrabster. So, you know, all your cod, coley, hake, um, cod and your hake are your more expensive ones. Coley, part of the cod family, still in its own right a very good fish. Um, but this is a cod, which is very, you know, getting a lot more responsibly fish now. Um, and it's, a, you know, a mainstay in the, in the kitchens. So I'll just uh, fill this off here. So usually when, when we're filleting, it's a lot easier when you've got the head on, you know, because you can take the whole fillet off and one We thought we'd make it difficult for him today, yeah, give him a bit yeah. of a challenge. That's it. From what he's used to. So if you just hold up the fish. So basically the, the cod, the, the nicest part of the cod or the part I prefer to use is basically the top loin. Again, I brought one along to show you. So this part here, and again, the side and all the way down the belly is a bit more fleshy and a bit more fatty in texture. A lot of people in higher end restaurants kind of throw that in a bin or just use a nice piece or use it for something else. But I tend to make a mousse with it and wrap it in the fish. So you can see this nice loin is it all we really use for the actual protein of the dish. And is the dish you're doing one that features in the restaurant, Graham? So yeah, this is on the menu at the moment. It's on with quite a lot of little garnishes, but for today I'm just trying to simplify it a little bit so everyone can try and replicate what we're doing. Right, Graham, you want that just straight along? Yep, so we take it just down at the, the, the centre of the fish, where the pin bones are. That's us. 
So like you can see, we've got two different types of texture. Nice, thick loin piece and a little flabby fat part of the belly. So from that belly, we take um, a blender. I'm not going to do it today. We take a blender and blend it up with some egg whites and some stock. What we tend to use in the restaurant is like the juices from cooking clams, mussels, razor clams, things like that. And it gives it a nice, strong taste. So then put it in a piping bag, like so. And we get our cod loin. So we take the loin off the cod and we salt it for about eight minutes, just to firm up the fish and let it dry out more. You'll be able to see from this one, it's quite almost translucent and quite dense compared to what it's like when it's first fresh. So what we're going to do next is just pipe this cod mousse on. So we have the fish laying skin side up. We take our little mousse and just pipe it over the top. It's quite a dense mousse when it's raw, but when it's cooked it's actually very nice and soft. Okay, from there we're just going to wrap the fish. And this is going to be part of how it's going to be shaped. If you want to roll it or keep it nice and um, natural shape, you can do either or. So in the restaurant, we just tend to tie up a little bit so we get a nice round shape on it. So that's going to be poached, okay? So we'd set that aside, and we've got one that's poaching away just now for us. So we tend to cook it about 50, 60 degrees for 20 minutes. And then it should, when you carve it, should have a nice, um, nice shiny texture. Mother of pearl, they call it, or nacre. So it's cooked absolutely perfectly. With the garnish, we're going to do a little butter sauce, quite classic. We'll just take some shallots. I'm assuming everyone's done a butter sauce before in college or at their workplace by now. Nothing too fancy about it. And the main ingredient, butter. How many you got in the kitchen with you, Graham? In the kitchen right now, there's eight chefs. <coughs> for, we do five days lunch and dinner. So it can be a push at times. And we close on our Monday, Tuesday, so it's just Wednesday to Sunday. So we've got him here on his day off. <laughs> okay. So for the butter sauce, we're just going to melt some butter, add our shallots. This is a thing where there's no real set recipe of this sort of thing we do in the kitchen. It's just doing it to taste. and a little clove of garlic in there too. Some people use some vinegar in the base, so I tend to just use white wine so it's not too acidic. So I'm just gonna let that sweat off while that sweats off. We're gonna talk about some shellfish and explain what we have, sure. and explain where they come from and how they're handled. So we've got three different types. We've got razor clams, scallops, and langoustines. We'd usually get the scallops in in their shell. Big, nice, extra large scallops that are hand-dived in Orkney, which we'll go over in a little second. But because of the weather, we weren't able to get any for this afternoon's yes. demonstration. So it can be a bit temperamental. Along with the mackerel, before you say it. They must have come <laughs> So yeah, we'll first talk about the scallops. This guy's an expert in it. He knows exactly where they come from and how to get them. And he passed information to me but I'm going to let him explain that for this one. Okay, so I think I've spoke to quite a lot of you um, through, through in the room. The, the main scallops that we get are Orkney scallops, and the reason they're so sought after um, is they're all hand-dived, which in one is a dangerous job, so you know they're quite expensive. And one of the main reasons that they're such a beautiful product is there's a, a, one of the last coral reefs in Scotland that comes round the side of Orkney. Um, and they're an integral part of the, of the ecosystem. So there are a lot of places it's, it's banned um, because what you have is when people go out and um, 
fish for scallops is they dredge it. And when, when, when they dredge scallops, they're taking all the seabed with them and, uh, and, it, and it, you know, the product is, you know, it's not, nowhere near as good. So the Orkney is really, really top notch. Um, you know, and we get, you get the big XLs and you've got really beautiful meat. But, you know, but today I didn't have any. So. Um, and then we have langoustines here, which are creole court all the time. Again, the, the quality of the product is through creole, creole catching, uh, same as lobster. Anything that's getting trawled, it's getting dragged along the bottom in nets and you know, they're coming up, they're dead. Fair enough if they're getting frozen down and sent abroad, it's very fine. But for chefs that want them here on, on uh, home soil, they want live kicking langoustines and that's what we do. So when we, we get them in at the, the factory, they're all in, in, in their creels, um, sorry, in, in tubes. Um, and then once we, once we get them out, they're all live and kicking. They get into the, the restaurant, still, still live and kicking. kicking. Quality, absolutely second to none. And the last shellfish we have here are the razor shells. These here are actually just off the Irish coast. And another thing, Scotland used to be very, very prominent for big, big, thick razor shells. Now, unfortunately, they, we went through a, a bit of time where people were fishing in the, in the, wrong, in the wrong way. Um, so a lot of the fishing grounds were, were cut off. And so there's only very few places left um, where we can get the razor shells. So, uh, you know, 90% of the time they're coming from the, the Irish coast. Still, still how, a good how do they How do they get them now? Well, these, these are all hand-picked, whereas the way, the reason they shut off fishing sites is because they were sending down electrodes and they were electrocuting the, the seabed and it was killing on the, you know, anything in the everything. seabed. <laughs> exactly, everything and everything. So, only thing that we'll go near is uh, hand-picked hand um, razor shells. So. Yep. Again, Scottish, you know, as I've said to a lot of people today, you know, we've got the best seafood, I think, in the absolute world on our doorstep. You know, we've got, you know, the langoustines, the lobsters, beautiful, beautiful shellfish, and all, all the fish, all the fish we need that are landed up in, up in the North Sea. Absolutely stunning fish we get here. And the langoustines, where are they from just now? These are West Coast. These are West Coast. Cotton so creels, the little baskets. Yeah, exactly. Cot cot cotton creels, just like the uh, the lobsters, and then they're put into tubes, so that so that, you know they're, they're they're sitting like that, and it just it just makes them it makes them um, live longer. So when we get them, the, like, as soon as we take the creel the, the tubes out, the the tubes off, they're jumping all over the place. Nice. Okay, so while we've been talking, we've been spent off the shallots and garlic. I've added a little bit of white wine and just reduced it down to a glaze. And now I'm just going to start monting in some butter. So we turn the heat right down. And we're just going to gradually add the butter. Seems like a lot of butter we're putting in, but you're not going to eat that much of it. So for the health conscious, it's fine. So the razor clams. Spoots in Scotland, no? Spoots, that's spoots. it. Spoots. Yeah, spoots. Why are they called spoots? Because they spoot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, they, yeah, that's it. It's, uh, so how do they spit? Spit. <laughs> no, if you see them, if you see them in the sand, when, when they're in the sand, uh, and they're like when the, when the tides, when the tides in, you'll see them. They, they come up, and and they, you know that, that's how they feed. Um, and then as they are, as the tide starts to go out, and they're coming down, it's they, they shoot water up as they're going into the sand, and and, and then and they duck back down again. And they duck back down again. Yeah. Yep. How do people gather them then if they're just up and down? Well, it's, again, it's digging. What, what they do is they, they look, they look for the, they look for the markings in the sand, uh, and then they go down for them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see them, yeah, you, exactly. You know, you, you see that. Yeah, they pop up. Um, but you know, you, a, anyone walking along the beach, you know, you see the, you see the markings where they, yeah. where, where they come up and down. So again, with the seaweed, I tend to use the Japanese stuff. There is a lot of Scottish seaweed around, but I think the quality of the Japanese stuff is second to none compared to what, what we have here on our doorstep. But I don't think that really matters because the main ingredients we're using are from our doorstep. So we try to source the best things we can use within reason. You know, if we need to go further afield for it, we try and do that for the customer. It's going to be better on the plate. So 
for the little broth that we're going to make, we're going to use the same dashi stock, but we're going to season it up. So a couple of ingredients with us. This is some white soya sauce. It's a little bit com more complex in flavor than dark soya sauce, and it gives a fresher mouthfeel as well when you're having it in this sort of broth, so it also stays clear. And we're also going to just cook all the shellfish and put them inside this broth and garnish with a little herbs. Nothing too complicated. Okay, so once our butter sauce is made, just nice and simple, we keep it quite thin, because what we're going to do is emulsify that through with some dashi. So we pass it off to remove all the shallots and garlic. I'll just add it back into the pan. So we just basically do this to taste again, for texture. There's no real recipe to weigh out, which is it's roughly about 50% butter sauce to dashi. But you can also add more to make it lighter or less to make it less tasty, but richer. So again, once the dashi is in, we're just going to season it up with a little bit of white soya. Anyone used white soya sauce before? No? So again, you can be a little bit more generous with this because it's not so deep in flavor. And if you want to get your hands on some of that, you're best going online, because it's quite difficult to source sometimes. So what's your favorite dish on the menu at the moment that you cook? At the moment, I, I tend to like the fish and shellfish. Our menu is heavily based on fish and shellfish, so there's only really a like on the taste menu, there's really only one protein dish of meat. The rest tends to be fish and shellfish or a vegetable-based dish. So uh, my favourite right now is the cod dish. Is it? That they do. Oh. So that's what I'm doing the demonstration on. So what we do with the cod is it's just been poached about 20 minutes, 56 degrees. You could go longer or shorter if you want, depends what sort of texture or flavour you're wanting. And again, very simply garnished just with the sauce. And the rest, I'm going to do it with um, a little duxella mushrooms, some mushroom puree, and a little bit of black truffle. So for the sauce, we're just going to give it a light buzz. I'll just bring it together a little bit more. Now, the, the important part of slicing the fish, so we tend to try and get a razor sharp knife. I don't know if anyone at home or college tends to cut fish after it's cooked, but it can be quite tricky. So we can cut it there and you can see the, the texture and the color of it, if everyone can see. And from can you see that? So it's only barely just cooked, okay? So we tend to then portion it. If you have a little look at this one here, you can see where the mousse has been topped on top of the, fle the flesh of the fish. Oh. So during service, this would all be cooked to order, almost, and then rested. So once it's been rested for a good 10 minutes, it tends to carve better. So we'll just continue carving this. And then the most important part is removing the cling film from it. You don't want to be giving your customers that. Have you had this in the restaurant, George? No? I don't think I've had that one, no. I think they're trying to say I'm long overdue a visit again. <laughs> And the mousse itself, you can use any sort of fish, so the recipe George will have. And you can use any sort of fish, you could use shellfish as well, and do similar sort of techniques with that. It's very adaptable. I think Glasgow just now, there's so many exciting um, eating places. Just Is that your excuse for not being in lately? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're full, they go elsewhere. <laughs> 
So nice and simple, just finish this dish off. So what I'm gonna do is just give it a little tiny blast of heat through the oven. So we take a little pan and just a little touch of butter on it. Or you can even use the butter papers that you save from your actual butter, okay? And we'll just give it a warm through the oven. Again, nice and fragile because it is just barely cooked. And from there, you're talking 30, 40 seconds. If it's any longer, it's going to fall to pieces and it won't be nice to eat at that stage. Okay, so I'm just going to move this cord out of the way because we're finished with this now. Yep. And I'm just going to prepare the scallops and langoustines. Not that there's much preparation to do on the scallops. No. <laughs> just pretend. Nature's fault, pretend. not ours. Pretend. <laughs> So we've got in some scallops that we've got along. Generally in a restaurant you have your scallops, we shuck them all out the shells. And the scallops got two main parts, really, or three you could call it. So you've got the actual flesh of the mussel that you'd want to eat. You've got the coral on the side, yep. and then you have all the innards. The, the scut and the, 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 the mussel in the end. So most people throw all that thing and stuff away. In the restaurant what we tend to do is we'll make a, a liquid out of that. And that could be like one of the liquids that goes into the fish mousse. Obviously, if it's a shellfish allergy and things like that, we're trying to avoid that with the fish so there's no crossover. But if we're making the mousse, we used to do it with scallops. We would put all the, the cooking juices from the scallop into that, that mousse. See how fast you shook them scallops? Blink of an eye and they were done. <laughs> I'm sure if we had any here, he would be able to shuck them a lot faster than I would. How many scallops do you think you've shucked it? A oh, week? Millions. So yeah, we just remove the row. Quite simple. You just put your finger in the side here and take that little muscle off and it will go round. A lot of people um, tend to bin the row or use it for drying out powders and things like that. Um, apart from making a stock, we don't really use it for much either because I don't really like the taste of it. And it's not the nicest thing to see on a plate either. So I'll just quickly check the cord again. So that's what we would want there. If you can see in the camera, it's still nice and opaque. Sorry. And it still has that little knackery on it, okay, which is the mother apparel look. So nice and simple to finish the dish. I've got a little Japanese pepper called Sancho pepper. It's a bit like uh, very citrus and lemon in flavor. We're just going to give it a nice tiny little sprinkle. And then we'll just remove the cod. Because we've put that pepper on, we don't actually need to put any lemon juice on to give it any, <coughs> any acidity. So again, I'm not doing any garnish with this dish, just the fish and the sauce. It doesn't really need much to be fair. It's quite, quite nice just to have it the way it is. Told a little fib, I'll maybe put a little bit of caviar on it. <laughs> so yeah, Wait. fish and caviar work, works well together. Gives it a little bit more saltiness ah, well, and seasoning. <coughs> Excuse me. Because <laughs> the fish hasn't actually been seasoned in a way. It's only been salted before. So it's all about the timings of the season of the fish. If you oversalt it, it also falls apart. If it's undersalted, it doesn't quite stick together. These jars can be a little nightmare. Okay. So the sauce as well, like I said before, you could serve it nice and rich and flat or quite heavy. You could put more dash in it, reduce it more, put less dash in it, you could cappuccino it. For this one, I just like it nice and flat and quite loose. And that is the first dish. Stuffed oh. loin of cod, osiedra caviar, dashi butter sauce, finished with some sancho pepper. Oh, amazing. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. That was amazing.
Don't be scared to taste it. So for the next dish, I'm going to use a bought-in product as one of the components of the dish, which is smoked mussels. We've tried in the restaurant for ages trying to smoke mussels and get the nice flavour, but we always find it tastes quite dirty and not very clean. So we tend to just buy the mussels in like this and use them. So for this dish, all I'm going to do is have a little broth made again of the dashi. We're going to season it up with some of the white soya sauce and the smoked mussels, and we're going to just cook all the shellfish. So first of all, we're going to blanch the langoustines to remove the tail meat, okay? In the restaurant, what we tend to do with the prawns is once they come in live, we tend to prepare them and freeze the tails flat on trays. I find that it gives a sweeter flavour once they're defrosted, and you can also peel them when they're semi-frozen and get a nice, clean-looking piece of langoustine tail. Sometimes when you blanch them or they lie in the fridge for long, they don't quite come out of the shell as easy. Yeah. And they die very fast, don't they? Die. Very and fast. once they're dead, the flesh breaks yep. down, Straight away. starts deteriorating, just like a prawn. So for us, getting them in, as soon as they're alive and kicking, twisting them off, freezing them. And then every time you have them, they're basically fresh because the freezers preserve them a little bit. So again, for that, we'll do the exact same thing. We just won't freeze them here. So we'll just twist the tails off. They are still alive. I can see some people being squeamish there. But at least we know they're fresh. <laughs> I can see the emails coming. <coughs> <coughs> so yeah, we go through a lot of langoustines. I mean, if you were to kill them, like putting a knife through a, a lobster with langoustines, we'd be there all day. Yeah. So once we do that, we tend to get this little middle fin here and twist it and pull, and it'll bring out the entrails. So you're still left with a nice presentable prawn tail. And no one wants to eat that anyway, so it's be best to remove it. That's hoofing. That's hoofing. Yeah, it's not very nice. <laughs> yes, it's not very nice. So again, razor clams, what we tend to do is wash them under a lot of running water to remove any sand that's going to be in them. And the important thing for them is to cook very fast. If you cook them slow or too long, they end up um, tasting a bit like elastic bands. Uh, absolutely. Like squid, the texture of overcooked squid, it's the exact same as that. So important to go very quick and not too long. We actually sometimes cook them in uh, vacuum pack bags flat and steam them so they open up and don't overcook very quickly. Yeah, we're working. Yeah, we're good. Fingers crossed. Okay, so nice and simple. I'll just move this board into the eye shot of the camera and take this one away. Is everyone following so far? It's quite simple, straightforward. Any questions for Graham? Anybody any questions? Yeah, it's just the style of food I tend to like enjoying. And as a chef, I don't think you should cook something you don't really like. Or there's not things I don't like, but. I cook with things that I tend to enjoy myself, and I think the customers will also enjoy. So that's just how I came about that style. And I find that using less salt and using things that replace the salt makes it more interesting because I've got a deeper flavor than just tasting salt generally. So things like your white soya sauce and your dashi base and things like that, to me, is a bit more interesting to eat. And as well, I love China and Japan and Asian countries, especially on days off. It's what, what I want to eat after cooking, like, precise food all week. Would you add any salt in if you're putting that in uh, with the white soya? I soil? tend not to use a lot of salt if I'm using the white soya and things like that. Um, or if you do just a little touch at the end. Minimalistic. Yeah. And these days, people don't really want to eat too much salt either. So it kind of works both ways. You get an interesting flavor without having the salt. I can't say the same for the butter though, because we do enjoy we do enjoy using a lot of butter. So I'll just take the razor clams, nice and quick, into a pan. Bear with me with the, the induction stove that we're using; we'll be fine though. And a wee touch of white wine I tend to use, and just a nice hot heat. And you'll see all that steam that's created. I've not covered it for that reason, so you can see how quick you need to cook them. 
But generally, in a roasting hot pan, a little bit of butter or olive oil, or you can go further and put some shallots and garlic and do like a classic mussel marinara. But for me, I just want the clean, fresh taste of the razor clams without anything else. Apart from a little bit of white wine, of course. Of course. Everyone worked with razor clams before or seen them or tasted them? Yeah. I love them, they're great. Who's tasted razor clams before? Spits? Hands up. <laughs> All right. I've never had them in Denny, I can tell you. So do you enjoy yeah. eating fish? You must be sick of looking at fish. No, I absolutely love it. You know, do you know and I never, I never used to eat it until I became a fishmonger. And then started working with fresh uh, shellfish and fish. And absolutely, don't think there's anything I don't like. Shell, shellfish especially. Love it. For me, about creating a balanced menu is all about, you know, you would never eat a piece of meat at the start of your meal and work your way back to me, you know. Fish and shellfish, we're lucky that we have everything close to hand that we can design a menu based on that at the start. But we do occasionally get the customers who think it's too much fish and shellfish. But as a balanced meal, I think it wor works for us. So the clams are just opening up. And we'll just decant them out of that pan. From there, I'm going to prepare them over the other side, just for health and safety and things. You can see the clam there, if everyone can see it. I'll move it forward a little bit. So this here is the part that we eat. The rest of it is kind of goes to waste. Or again, stocks and sauces for other items. So the best way to get it out is just basically to pull it out. There's no, there's no technique involved at all, so you pull it out. And then from here, we would try and cool it down quickly as well, so they don't continue cooking and get tough. And you can see they're just opened. I'm sure you must be able to get some of these down the beach here. St. Andrews here, I thought so, eh? So, we're just going to... Usually skinny dippers in St. Andrews, but I don't know about that. <laughs> Is that the spoots? Just <laughs> behave yourself. This is a family show. We'll see all the students out uh, after this with our salt and down the little holes. They're quite fascinating when you see them go up. You see a lot of them go up together. It's yeah. So for this little broth, I just want a nice li clear liquid. Loads of shellfish in it, nice and clean tasting. An ideal first course, second course. Another thing you we sometimes do in the summer, we serve it cold, so we take the dashi and add a little bit of gelatin and agar and set it in a nice set jelly, and you can put all your cold shellfish on it. So it's like you can use this for a million different things. Cooking vegetables, anything nice. at all really. So we're going to slice the razor clams down a little bit, and you'll get nice attractive little triangle pieces like so, and they look quite nice all floating through the broth. So do you take um, any young people into the kitchen doing stages or some such? Graham? Yeah, of course, the door's always open. So the industry's um, a place right now where I think everyone needs some staff and everybody wants some young people in the kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, um, obviously, Cece there from restaurant, Andrew Fairley, who was earlier 17, um, you only get there by chapping on the door. That's um, excellent. Mr. That's how Cheever, it should be. Chef, can I, can, I go, can I work for a few days, see if I like it? Um, turn up your shoes clean and your attitude right um, and just see what happens from there. I'm sure every kitchen in the world right now would welcome anyone into that. Yeah. But then every kitchen is not like your chef. <laughs> Don't know if that's a compliment mm. or an insult. Oh, it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. Okay, so with the mussels, what I'm going to use is, we don't really like buying them in, but as I explained, we've tried to smoke them and played about with them, but you just don't get the same clean taste. So we make a little mayonnaise with the oil sometimes, mm. which is quite simple. So sorry, where are these from? These mussels are from a place called the Kintara Smokehouse. We get them off... Yeah, my friend here. You might know a little bit more about it than I do. I'm just. I'm wondering. You see, when you're talking about when you you freeze the langoustines, quite like I'm wondering if that's 
maybe what, what happens do with, with the them muscles. because if you're saying when you're taking them in fresh and then trying to smoke them in a, in a straight off, I think maybe that's what they do with, yeah. with these here. They're a little bit firmer in texture. I'll leave them behind and everyone yep. can have a little taste if they want some. Ah, well, everybody have a taste of them. Is that not what they did with Langoustine's COP26? Did they not freeze them down? Yeah? Had thousands of them then. Yeah, it works a treat. I was actually up in Loch Fine last week on the boat fishing for the Langoustines and we were getting ones the size of my arm. They were like lobsters. Oh, gee. And seeing the work the guys put into it, it's fascinating because you always think, oh, we're just getting in six kilo Langoustines each day. It's, it's fine. Where are they coming from? But these guys are out there with lines of 50 creels and pulling up each creel and there's maybe one Langoustine or two Langoustines or, you know, there's not many in each one. And it's hard work. They're out there all day. So that's when you, you see the cost, you start to appreciate, well, that's why it costs a lot of money. To me, it's worth the value. I mean, the price of fish now is God, that is getting, going, getting, going north. Getting, quite, getting quite high, but I believe that there's always going to be a market there for it. Mm. Just about maybe being more sensible with the product like we do with the moose and trying to make it stretch out a little stretch bit further, but yeah, keep the quality there. So I'm just going to blanch these langoustines in a minute and peel them, and there's nothing really that more technical than just dropping them in the boiling water for 10 seconds. Obviously, the, the less time they're in there, the better. And I'm going to finish off this little broth as well. Something everyone can try at home, do you reckon? Uh, absolutely. Well, I hope so. Yeah. So Again, I'm you wouldn't really need to buy this Pacific seaweed or the Pacific combo. You can actually get stuff online or you can get it in Asian shops. There's a Scottish company called Mara Seaweed as well that serve a similar product, but for me this is um, night and day compared to the quality. That's so that's why we use this. And it's, it's very expensive as well, this. We're talking 140 pounds for this, it's at one kilo. So because it's that expensive and because it's a nice product, once we're finished, once the spent combo's been in the, the dashi, we tend to take it out and we make a paste out of the seaweed and a few other ingredients like soya sauce and mirin. And when you taste it, it's just a big hit of umami, as they call it, like big savoury hit. Even on a plate underneath a bit of meat, we put that underneath a bit of meat as well. And it just gives a real depth of flavour without knowing that there's something else on the plate. So it makes it a little bit more complex. I'll leave some of this here, George, if anyone wants to taste it later right, as well. We'll put the table out and we'll get you in the chat and we'll put it all out. Yeah. So... We're trying to slightly warm this. We tend not to boil it because it starts to bring out any impurities and it doesn't have a nice clarified finish. So we're just going to warm it up slightly. Again, you could thicken it up with a little bit of xanthan gum or kuzu starch or something like that if you wanted a more thick mouthfeel. But I tend to have this broth just as a nice light broth, almost like a chicken noodle soup. So the shellfish is all the, all the chicken and noodles and this is the soup. And we're going to finish it with some little sea herbs. So we use in the restaurant quite a lot these little things called oyster leaves. Tastes like oyster. I'll leave some of them back as well. Some little dill fronds for a little bit of freshness. And we have one other product which we sprinkle through the broth, which is this. It's a little finger lime. So again, it brings acidity to the dish. These limes are from Spain right now. Usually we get them from New Zealand. But there's nothing really like it in a Scottish product that we could replace it with apart from like segments of citrus fruits, but that would also work well. We tend to use these just because they're tiny little pops of caviar. I'll cut one open just so you can see. So when you break it open, it just breaks into little beads of caviar. And it tastes Have very complex that? and fresh. Have a taste, George. Yeah. Have a taste, George. Interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't know if that's a good face or a bad face. It's got, it's got a citrusy flavour, but it's also got like an almost perfumey, complex, flowery flavour behind it as well. So it works well. There's texture to it as well. I don't have enough to pass around, George. They're quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can get them, they're worth the money, but they're, yeah, they're £150 a kilo. So I'll just put it on my next bill. 
<laughs> so the smoked mussels, what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to just lay a couple on the plate. Again, being very cautious about the amount because they're very smoky. Great endorsement for the product from you, that is. Mm. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not getting paid for that. No. <laughs> So langoustine tails, we're just gonna, we're gonna actually finish cooking these inside the broth, which is now warm. First of all, I'm just gonna quickly blanch them. Literally a few seconds is enough. Again, when we're doing this in the restaurant, if we were blanching them this way, we'd have the water heavily seasoned, almost like seawater, and I find that makes the langoustines taste sweeter. So again, to peel it, we just crush the shell between your fingers, pull the shell off. And again, these are quite small ones, you can get them. The, the bigger, the better, I think, with the langoustine. What do you think? Aye, much, much better. So there's a langoustine tail out of the shell, <coughs> with no entrails in it, the most important part. They are a lot harder to get, though, the the big double zeros, you know what I mean? If, if, if someone's got them on their menu, you know, you always say you can get them one week and then you're, yeah. you're back to the... Luckily, I've tapped into a new source, so I'm sorry I'm not buying from you anymore. So where are you? <laughs> uh, where, so where are you up in uh, what I was, part of uh, Fine? I've got a friend that's just got a hotel in Loch Fine and he's just started doing langoustines in Rodier, so we tend to start getting some things off him. Where about The main reason is because of supply, that we know we can get them every week and he's keeping the big ones for us. And he has little pots... He's got to keep the big ones for us. No, no, the real, real reason I'm asking is because I, was, I, I grew up in Furness. I was trying to, I was trying to ignore him <laughs> and not tell him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, not far from Furness, just in uh, Inverary. Oh, all right, okay. What's the name? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be asking for his phone number next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he'll be buying them and charging me double. <laughs> so yeah, we've got a good source. Like I said, he tends to drop them off once a week. And he keeps, keeps all the large ones Perfect. and creels oh. for us. So I'm not, it's not because I don't want yours, it's just yep. purely oh. because we can get what we want for the menu and we're, not, we're being consistent with the customers that are getting the same product each time they come. Okay. Langoustines are my favourite shellfish. A lot of people like lobster better, but I tend to no. enjoy no. langoustine. Langoustine for me. Yep. Okay, so we're going to finish this dish really simply. Nothing hard about it. I'm going to taste the broth and make sure I'm happy with the flavour, first of all. Which I am. And I'm just going to add the langoustines into this warm broth. So you're talking it's sitting at like 70 degrees. It's obviously going to drop a little bit of temperature when you put the langoustines in. And all the razor clams as well. It's almost like a one pot wonder, this one, but it's something that everybody could do, I think. And for the scallops, I'm going to serve these raw inside the dish, but by the time it gets to the guest, it's going to be cooked. So they're very thinly sliced. So literally a minute to cook the fish and the broth, and we can finish plating up. I'll just remove this board first. Does one feature on the menu at the moment? No, it doesn't. It's just um, something we were working on for the summer. Okay. Um, again, more light flavours in the summer. Not as rich and heavy. This is more like a, a wintry dish that you could use for anything. Like that's why it's in the menu just now. It's um, yeah. nice and rich in flavour and texture as well. So we've just put the broth on. We'd add a little bit of herb oil, something along the lines of the oyster leaves. Finish it with the razor clams. And add some finger lime. It really looks so fresh, it looks summery, it looks... 
It's not a difficult factory. dish to pull off, you know, and you, no. can, you can replicate it anywhere really once you have this base of stock. And then you can adapt it to any sort of fish and shellfish you want. And that is us. Oh, amazing. Hope you all enjoyed seeing the two dishes. And I hope they're simple enough that you can do it at home as well and play about with them as well and adapt it. So from the base recipes that you get, you can add your own twist on it and create something completely different, something better. So have fun and enjoy it. Yeah, well, like, um, have a chat. Anybody got a question for Graham? Um, I think it's nice for the staff because it makes the chefs behave themselves a lot more for a start. Because <laughs> people can see them, they're always on show. Um, for me, it was just about trying to have that interaction with the guests as well and making people more interested. I think people these days aren't just going out for dinner or a meal or food. They're going out for the whole package, the service, how the food's delivered, yeah. how the place looks, rather than just eating a plate of amazing food, but nothing else is there. It gets a bit boring. Yeah, because I've seen you serving the, the main course in the restaurant. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to help out. <laughs> <laughs> Give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.